So welcome everyone, we'll, we'll get started. Um, welcome to this Equality Studies webinar. Um, my name is Ruben Flores. I am co-convener of the Equality and Flourishing Research Cluster of the UCD Equality Studies Center. Unfortunately, Nari Moran, our center director, cannot join us tonight as something urgent has come up for her. Uh, so she sends her apologies. For those of you who don't, who don't know the Equality Studies Center, it has existed at UCD since 1989 as an interdisciplinary center concerned with the analysis of all forms of, forms of inequality. We currently have five research clusters in the center, populated by members from across UCD, on equal societies, equality and flourishing, critical political economy, equality human rights, and anti-discrimination. This webinar has been organized by the Equality and Flourishing Cluster. So we think it will be of general interest to members of, and friends of the center. Today's webinar is devoted to the book, Rentier Capitalism and its discontents, Power, Morality and Resistance in Central Asia by Balihar Sanghera and Elmira Satibaldiba, which was published this year by Palgrave Macmillan. The book offers, and I quote, a moral economic critique of post-Soviet cap capitalism and offers a critical lens through which to understand the role of rentierism, not only in the post-Soviet space, but also in other parts of the world. We are very, very lucky today to have Dr. Balihar Sanghera to talk to us about the book. Unfortunately, um, Dr. Elmira Satibaldiva cannot join us today due to other commitments. Um, and before we, we start, let me say a few words about their work. Um, so Elmira is a senior research fellow at the Conflict Analysis Research Center, School of Politics and International Relations at the University of Kent, and the leading scholar of Central Asian societies. Dr. Balihar Sanghera is a senior lecturer in sociology at the University of Kent, uh, and his main research interests are political economy, social theory, and ethics. Their work is exemplary of the possibilities of combining empirical research and fieldwork with normative ethics and political economy. They have written extensively, individually and as a team, on a wide range of topics from debt to moral economy, and from international investment strategies in Central Asia to social movements. This book, which is the product of over 15 years of research about Central Asia, explores an important chapter in the global history of neoliberal dispossession and organized resistance to rentier capitalism. Uh, Balihar will speak for approximately 40 minutes and then we will open the floor for questions. Please write your questions in the Q&A section of the webinar either as we go along or, or at the end of the talk. I can also mute people if you would like to ask your questions in person, but your camera won't turn on. If you would like to avail of this option, please attract uh, my attention to a discussion part by uh, um, in the discussion part by raising your hand or writing to me in chat asking to meet you for a question. So the webinar will be recorded and, and, and then shared via uh, the school website and we will aim to finish by uh, quarter past seven. So Balihar, thank you so much for accepting the invitation to join us today and so the floor is yours and I'll, sh I'll stop sharing and let you um, share your slides as well. Okay, thank you uh, Ruben. Uh, let me just share my slides. Uh, There we go. Okay, can you see that, Ruben? Yeah, I can. I can see. Okay, that. great. Um, firstly, uh, but before I begin, can I just uh, 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 thank Ruben and Maria for for the invitation? Um, I'm really delighted to uh, give this presentation at the uh, uh, University College Dublin. Um, and of course, I've known Ruben for a long time, so this is a great occasion. Uh, for for us to reconnect after many years, uh, known him since uh, since he was at uh, Kent uh, and 
not so long ago. Um, unfortunately, as Ruben was saying, uh, um, Amira is, is unable to join us due to uh, other commitments. Um, so she does send her best wishes to us all here. Um, as um, uh, Ruben was saying, um, this, this, this presentation is based on work uh, and material that, uh, that uh, Amir and I have done over many years. And the talk will draw upon the material from the book. Um, and I, and I kind of appreciate that sometimes that's some of the, I, some of the information may be a bit too uh, uh, short in description, but I do encourage colleagues to look at the book for greater details. Um, so both Amir and I, we wanted to understand the various forms of social suffering and harm that has taken place in Central Asia since the collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, and in particular, we were looking at Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan. Um, and what we saw was, was a really a sad state of affairs. In the uh, forms of suffering that was taking place, increased level of indebtedness and how people were struggling to pay off debt at high interest, people lacking adequate homes, affordable homes, and having to then erect informal settlements on the outskirts of major cities, the capitals, Bishkek, Almaty, Astana. And these informal settlements, slums, lacking sanitation and electricity, and where the residents also didn't have legal uh, rights to be staying in the city, what's called Papriska. So we're uh, unable to access some of the basic goods like education and medical services. And until recently, they weren't even entitled to vote. Moreover, we've seen the increased level of precarity, uh, both in the states of Central Asia, but also abroad as a result of migration to Russia, and where a lot of migrants are having to work in informal sectors or precarious work uh, with very little protection. Increasingly, we've seen as a result of predatory drilling and mining in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan, intense pollution and damage to the eco ecosystem. And of course, with all this, problems are exacerbated by extreme level of inequality of wealth and income, which allows the very rich to occupy senior positions of political power, both at the national level, the national parliament, but also at the local level in city councils curtailing any sense of what we mean by political participation, or democratic participation, constraining uh, uh, people's democratic voices. And if all that wasn't enough, you also have increased level of corporate corruption and systematic fraud taking place in many of the key sectors of the economy. So, Alan Mayer and I, we were interested in trying to explore how did this state of affairs occur? Why was it taking place? Especially after the high hopes of the collapse of the Soviet Union. Some of these problems that we just outlined, of course, mirrors the problems that are taking place elsewhere in the global south, as Ruben pointed out. But also, as we're noticing, also in the global north. Often the usual explanations are that it's to do with kleptocracy, corruption, criminal elements of government that are hindering economic development. If only the state 
were to embark upon rigorous and rapid development uh, of reforms, uh, stringent rule of law, protection of private property rights, independent judiciary, things would be different, it is argued. But I think this, or, or these explanations tend to miss the an analysis of capital and class uh, and how the nature of capitalism that has emerged in Central Asian economies uh, can be the root explanations and causes of the problems that we just discussed and the, some of the sufferings that we've just uh, outlined. But also it doesn't adequately give us an understanding of what was the vision of the free market as, as post-Soviet economies embarked upon the transition from a planned economy to a market society. What did that vision look like? What was it trying to achieve? Maybe the problem lay with the vision itself. And this is some, and this is a point that uh, 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 we will explore a bit later on. Moreover, it's also worth thinking that when we think about property rights and its protection, whose particular property rights are we uh, protecting? The ordinary individual or the rich foreign investor? Now, Amir and I, we argue that rent is a significant part of the Central Asian economies. Now, scholars uh, familiar with Central Asian studies, uh, and even the post-Soviet studies, will acknowledge that rent seeking is a pervasive part of the economy. But they usually focus on illegal forms of rent seeking, those that occur in the public sector. Uh, officials uh, seeking bribes from investors, often they argue, is a reason for the rent extraction that takes place. Or they will note how the rich resource Central Asian economies, as well as uh, uh, some of the post-Soviet economies, are also resource rich. And so the natural resource rent is going to be a significant part of the economy. And I think their point is right. But they tend to miss the second part uh, of forms of rent seeking. Those that exist in the private sector and are legal, such as interest or what's sometimes called usury, land and ground rent, capital gains occurring and resulting from speculation, dividends as a result of holding shares, fees, the ability to, to uh, uh, put commission on, on so-called services, as well as some of the newer forms of rent extraction that Christopher Brent in his excellent book, Rontier Capitalism has explored, such as platform rent, spectrum rent, contract rent, as well as some of the older forms such as the natural resource or natural monopoly rent. And both Amir and I, what we try to do is to say that if the first form of rent, the, the public sector uh, rent seeking and natural, natural resource rent is problematic and deservedly re requires critical scrutiny, why is it that the second form, the, those that exist in the private sector, as well as those the legal ones, such as interest, land, capital gains, how come these don't get adequate attention and critical scrutiny as well? So our work is trying to look at the second form to say that these forms of rent require attention and, and their examination of their consequences. So what is rent? So rent 
is based on unequal ownership and control of existing scarce assets and resources, credit money, land, lateral resources, as well as things like patents, uh, virtual space. These are all forms of assets and resources that are controlled by the property powerful class, what I, what I sometimes also call the rentier class, who are able to dominate through their ownership, the populist class. And you can see this in this kind of uh, a, a diagram that, I, that, 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 I've, that I've shown here, in which you have the asset rich rentier class, the property class, having control of resources, which the populist class, the asset poor, lack, but need and want for their survival. And in doing so, the former group, the powerful, rich property class, are able to charge exorbitant prices for this access that the asset poor require for their well-being. And this results in increased level of indebtedness and high charges, excess uh, uh, interest rates, shortage of housing, leading to exorbitant housing rent, lack of options of adequate utilities, gas, electricity, telecommunication, leading to rising utility prices, as well as people being forced to pay higher insurance costs. And what's particularly interesting about this transition that's taken place in Central Asia, as well as in other parts of the world, is how this came about. Especially in the case of the Soviet Union, where rent extraction was criminalized as unearned income and speculative gains. It was criminalized. It was deemed to be illegitimate forms of making money, which after the collapse of the Soviet Union, neoliberalism has legitimized and promoted. So to offer an account of this transition and this change that's taken place, and Mary and I draw on the work of Andrew Sayer and his work on the moral economy perspective. And it offers four key features. Firstly, it argues that uh, we need to interrogate how moral sentiments, norms, rules, justification and power relations constitute economic practices and institutions. It seeks to understand how moral dimensions of life shape economic practices, but then how economic forces competition can reinforce compromise and override the economic, uh, uh, override the moral dimensions of uh, economic practices. And in doing so, it argues that all economies are moral economies. And this departs from the work of E.P. Thompson, uh, James Scott, and other writers uh, who, who uh, 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 have written on uh, moral economy, who tend to use the term very selectively and exclusively to examining uh, pre-capitalist economies. What we argue is that capitalist societies are also moral economies. The second dimension of the perspective is that it offers a critical way to evaluate economic activities in terms of their implications on people's well-being. And in doing so, 
what this perspective argues is that it's not merely enough to describe and explain economic practices and institutions. You also have to evaluate them because economic arrangements affect human flourishing. And in doing so, social analysis cannot avoid the normative implications of these economic practices. The third part of this is that the, the, the perspective tries to assess whether the moral justifications and norms for economic activities are reasonable or not. And in doing so, it overcomes the usual barriers to uh, uh, critical social science, where colleagues often feel that they can't make value judgments because that's seen as not scientific or not objective. The moral economy perspective rejects this dualism between is and ought or fact and value and argues that value judgments are an important part of the description of the economic activities. And it overcomes the usual disciplinary boundaries that so often hinders critical social work, where ethics or moral philosophy constrains what can be said and uh, 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 examined either in sociology or economics. Predisciplinary writers such as Adam Smith, uh, 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 Stuart, Stuart Mills, so uh, John Stuart Mills, uh, write more contemporary writers like Marcia Sen, have all tried to overcome these boundaries that, that constrain and shackle social science and offer a more post-disciplinary perspective uh, and inquiry into uh, uh, examining economic activities. So that what we then can do is to offer a judgment whether the economies are moral or not, or even mixed. And what we argue in the book is that that large part of the Central Asian economies can be deemed to be immoral insofar as it results in harm, damage to people's lives. And the fourth dimension that I want to bring out for you is that the perspective views individuals, people as evaluative beings who can judge social relationships and practices as right or wrong, good or bad. All too often when we think about individuals, we see them as, as, as people who are strategic in how they play the game or how they give meanings to their practices. But of course, individuals also can navigate their way through the world in relation to their concerns and goals, as Margaret Archer points out. We're not merely strategic players. We care about the people that we're responsible for. We care about our environment. And in doing so, we, are, we do make judgments about whether things are proper or improper. So in, in the book, um, Amir and I try to show how drawing on the moral economy perspective, we can see how some of the key actors such as the banks, property developers and oil companies and uh, mining companies how, were, how they were able to justify rent extraction. And what we found was that the 
lenders, the banks and the microfinance institutions tended to defend usury and high interest rates by drawing on an idealized form of market transaction. So for them, the market was idealized as a voluntary transaction in which individuals had choice, freedom, and formal equality to participate. All sides were equal in their transaction. Moreover, they argued that the market was a modernizing project and that this contrasted with uh, uh, what existed before, either under the Soviet Union or uh, what was uh, happening uh, in many parts of rural uh, uh, Central Asia with the rise of Islam and how Islam was constraining women's participation in economic and public life. So for them, the lenders, they saw the market as truly a form of freedom for all concerned. Moreover, they argued that the borrowers were obliged to pay back the loans that they had taken out on the basis of the sanctity of contracts. And that people who failed to pay back were dishonoring their promises. So they used uh, moral discourses, moral norms to reinforce the idea that borrowers who took out loans at high interest had to pay back. Moreover, uh, when we look at the, uh, the property developers, the construction, the construction companies uh, and those dealing in the real estate, they justified the, the selling and buying of luxury apartments in order to achieve capital gains as a cultural norm. It was seen as uh, something that was no different to uh, traders in the market selling bread or to people buying cars. So the idea of buying and selling elite apartments that were unused and unoccupied was no different to other parts of speculation trading that existed in the economy. And when we looked at <coughs> the uh, oil and gas companies and the mining companies, they sought to protect their ownership of natural resources and the ability to extract rent from the ownership of natural resources on the basis of the rule of law. The Central Asian countries had signed up to uh, uh, international treaties which protected the rights of foreign investors. And part of that international treaty was that if there was any disputes between the nation state and the investor, the dispute would go to arbitration, international courts, uh, where three unelected judges would determine whether uh, uh, there were any violations to the foreign investors' property rights. In addition, the, the uh, transnational corporations drew upon the discourse of the free market as a way of protecting their assets, arguing that in a globalized uh, economy in which there were no barriers, investors 
should be protected from owning uh, uh, the, the, the properties that they had and should be protected from any possible nationalization or taxation from governments trying to claim greatest share of uh, the income from, from, from the uh, uh, corporations. Um, the, the, the state we found was key in the expansion and, legitim and the legitimation of rent in Central Asia. It was a state that had created and institutionalized the neoliberal regime of property rights. They had decriminalized unearned income and speculation, uh, sought to remove usury, rent and capital gains as criminal offenses and sought to normalize them as part of the market economy. Moreover, the states, the Central Asian states, uh, deregulated and desupervised various parts or key parts of the uh, economy, such as finance, real estate, and the natural resource sector. And in doing so, it was assumed that the, the state was acting to institute the free market. But here's a, an interesting point, because what is a free market? Now, to classical political economy, such as Adam Smith, Ricardo, John Stuart Mill, John Stuart Mills, and uh, uh, John Maynard Keynes, the free market meant markets were to be free of rent. So requiring the state to regulate rent-seeking activities. And why did they argue this? Well, they argued that the rentiers, the property, the rich, powerful property owners, the feudal lords, the monopolies, that they were acquiring income that were unearned, unjust. Uh, famous saying by uh, 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 Adam Smith, the, the, the landlords reap what they have not sown. John Stuart Mills, arguing that the, the rentiers make money in their sleep. They haven't contributed to their income. They've shown no skill, energy or labor, yet by mere virtue of owning the property, they're able to extract rent, dividends, payments of various kinds. So we've seen that unjust. Moreover, they argued that economic rent merely added cost to production. It was a deadweight loss to society. It just increased the cost of production and did nothing else other than that. What we see uh, with the, the emergence of the uh, 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 of, of um, under, under neoliberalism is this loss, this change of meaning of the free market. For the neoliberal actors, it meant, free market meant, uh, 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 meant uh, markets were to be allowed to freely extract rent free of state control whether those actors uh, were bankers, property developers, oil companies, mining companies, that they should be freely able to extract rent without any oversight by the government. Now, a key part of the 
uh, moral economy perspective, as I uh, uh, mentioned earlier, but that he seeks to evaluate the effects of Ronkeism. And Almir and I, we, we try to, in our book, offer various accounts of how Rontiaism, rent extraction, contributed to damaging effects in society. We looked at the top 20 richest individuals in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan, and we saw that largely they obtained their income through banking, real estate, and natural resources. There was this extreme level of inequality of income and wealth in society. The top 1%, the richest, earning, owning almost 50% of the country's wealth, whilst the poorest 50% owning no more than 5, 10%. We also saw how rentierism or rent extraction resulted in social suffering, largely as a result of people having to struggle to pay excess charges, rent, interest, people becoming dispossessed because they couldn't pay off their loans some even committing suicide. Rontism, as a result of the deregulation, desupervision and decriminalization, also contributed to the criminogenic environment in the public and private sector. The mayor and I explore how the, uh, the mayors of both in Almaty and Bishkek were all involved in corruption as a result of allocating land to corporate investors. The ecocide that developed as a result of Rontism, the, uh, the oil companies, gas companies, mining companies, especially gold, gold mining companies in, in uh, Kazakhstan, undertaking predatory uh, mining and drilling to extract at an ever faster rate the resources underground and thereby contributing to uh, global warming as well as damage to the ecosystem, the fragile ecosystem, especially in Kazakhstan, in Kyrgyzstan, the loss of the uh, glaciers uh, in the mountains. But what it also did was that it resulted in uh, a protocracy in which the very rich individuals, the, the top 20%, uh, so the, the top richest individuals in Kyrgyzstan, all seemingly occupied key positions of uh, government and uh, national parliament. Um, and we highlighted how a lot of the rich individuals had made their money prior to entering political life, political office. And in uh, uh, Bishkek, for instance, the, most of the councillors of the uh, capital you know, of Kyrgyzstan, Bishkek, most of the members, the councillors were uh, 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 rentiers either having ownership of banks, real estate, or natural resources. Moreover, we note how as a result of the international treaties and the, uh, um, the um, arbitration courts, how this resulted in the emergence of what was sometimes called neo neoliberal constitutionalism, which enabled the, the structure of legal and judicial mechanism for protecting the rights of foreign investors, thereby constraining 
local democratic voices. And this was certainly the case when our mayor and I looked at oil and gas in, in Kazakhstan and gold mining in Kyrgyzstan, how local voices who were protesting against the uh, uh, criminal, criminal behavior of the oil companies and, and, and mining companies were often silenced because the state needed to protect the rights of the foreign investors. This then, of course, led to various problems, outbursts of violence, protests, revolts, especially in Kyrgyzstan, but also resulting in forms of popularism uh, in which people sought to turn to uh, uh, populist leaders as a way of overcoming the formal political structures. So the kind of resistance that we saw uh, was, became a key part of the book. So uh, Ruben, how, how long do I have? About five, five minutes, yeah. Thanks. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, became a key part of the book. And uh, in particular, we wanted to look at how people responded to the various harms and social suffering that existed. A lot of the harms were, uh, uh, we already outlined, um, and then how they often responded was, was through emotional resistance and moral resistance, objecting to the practices undertaken by bankers, property developers, and the, uh, uh, the mining companies and uh, 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 the gas and uh, oil companies. And so they, so they, of course, this is only to be expected given that individuals are evaluative beings who have a relation of concern to their world. Now, a key part of their response was acquiescence, a sense of resignation that nothing can be done. We just have to accommodate the existing powerful structures. What can we do against the powerful corporate interests? And in many ways, this reflects how Bordeauxians uh, understand uh, uh, the plight of the powerless, that they just more or less resign themselves to the existing inequalities. But what we also saw was that there were uh, uh, critical resistance, that the emotional resistance that people had turned into political resistance. And in the book, we discuss the Planian double movement that occurred where in key sectors of finance, real estate, and the natural resource, grassroots resistance occurred, uh, in which uh, 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 counter movements developed to 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 resist the uh, neoliberal qualification of money, land, and labor. So the kind of movements we saw were like the anti debt movements in both Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan, land and housing movements in those two countries, environmental movements to protest against the uh, uh, corporate interests as well as the labor movements, particularly in Kazakhstan, where this was more pronounced than in Kyrgyzstan. So rent extraction involved both class struggle in where social, social struggle uh, occurred around property rights, the limits to foreign ownership, the limits to uh, lenders' right to, to take and, and, and dispossess borrowers of their, uh, of, of their property, their collateral property, but also struggle over the distribution of rent, trying to cap, for example, uh, uh, interest rates that occurred in Kyrgyzstan more than in Kazakhstan. 
But this was a battle of unequal relations in which the state sided very much with the foreign investors, where the state countered the grassroots movements through a mix of both accommodation and oppression, co-optation and violence. And, and in the book, uh, we offer a detailed account of the relationship between the state and the counter movements and how, because of class fragmentation, uh, uh, state strategy of divided rule resulted in many of these grassroots movements uh, achieving small measure, uh, achieving limited uh, success. And let me just finally end with this slide here. Um, so of course, both Almir and I are trying to offer a more economy perspective here, where we are trying to evaluate the nature of the economy in Central Asia. And we do so using a range of ethical criteria by which we can see, score whether the countries, so whether the economy is, is achieving uh, uh, harm, success, uh, damaging to people's lives, or to what extent it's, it's, it's resulting in greater well being. And overwhelmingly, we offer a negative assessment. Firstly, in terms of contributive injustice, that the owners of the scarce resources are able to obtain income whilst producing nothing. They get something for nothing. They don't contribute anything to the economy, yet they are able to extract rent from the uh, uh, producing, from, from the others who produce the surplus, uh, surplus value. It also involves distributive injustice in, in, in that uh, rontism results in undeserved and unequal distribution of income and wealth. As, 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 as we were mentioning earlier in the presentation about the top 20 uh, uh, richest individuals having almost 50% of all wealth. In, the, in those two countries. It also contributed to plutocratic uh, regime uh, in which senior political positions were captured by the rich and how the rich and powerful uh, uh, business elites were able to uh, uh, lobby for regulatory changes to make uh, rentierism even more profitable. Also leading to uh, environmental injustice. Uh, I've already kind of uh, mentioned this already, how climate change as a, has, and global warming has resulted uh, as a result of excessive amount of drilling in Kazakhstan but also the, the damage to the uh, uh, fragile ecosystem in Kyrgyzstan as a result of gold mining. And then to end on the idea that this is also one which is of social suffering in which people don't have adequate access to basic goods and services that they need for their well-being, goods such as housing, uh, uh, credit, uh, uh, utilities at affordable prices because they are all too often charged exorbitant prices. Okay, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much, Malihar. We have a question and we'll, it's now time for questions. So if anyone wants to send comment or question, please feel free. We have one question here by um, Kieran. If the choice were available, would the people of these uh, states prefer to return to an old Soviet system? And um, yeah, what do you think, Valihar? 
I don't think uh, uh, the choices between uh, what was what was uh, uh, between what we have now and the choice between what existed beforehand. I think I think a more meaningful uh, option would be what is it that we can do to constrain rent extraction. Uh, the problem isn't necessarily. I mean, clearly markets are, are important. Uh, they offer, you know, they do enable the uh, economies to work better than a planned economy. And, uh, you know, this is an argument that uh, Hayek had with uh, some of the socialist economists that you do need the markets because the overwhelming complexity of the economy means that you need a way of distributing information and prices do th and prices do that. They help to communicate uh, uh, information that a planned economy just would struggle to achieve. So I think I think the choice is really is this: Do we want to constrain rent extraction, or do we want it to uh, go unregulated? That's the choice, and I think many of the uh, individuals that we spoke to would want to constrain uh, the uh, the uh, level of rentism that's taking place. And after all, surely this is what is meant by the free market. Uh, going back to Adam Smith, uh, uh, John Stuart Mill, and Ricardo, and uh, T. H. Toning. You know, they all saw rentism as immoral, uh, unearned income, uh, property that's used merely as an instrument of gain and power, not used in ways to achieve people's well being. And uh, uh, John Hobson coined the term in property, not property, but in property to argue that, uh, uh, that in the hands of the rentiers, something like money, land, and other key assets have become mere uh, instruments for unearned income, when they should be used much more constructively for people's well-being. And I am trying to see if I can see any more questions. Well, I, I, I have on one question or a few questions. Um, so what, you know, that we know what needs, what we need to do, but how to go about doing this, right? How like social movements seem to have a very hard time facing the state and, you know, state repression. So what, it's, it's a little bit uh, easy as well to fall into some kind of hopelessness, right? Um, and what do you do in these cases? <laughs> you know, the um, 64 million, <laughs> your question. Yeah, no, that's, uh, and of course that's, uh, that's a key question, isn't it? It's, 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 uh, it's a question of how, do we build alliances so that we can overcome the powerful property class? Um, and, 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 and I think as, as was alluded by the first questioner, clearly some people have done well out of the system. Uh, people who see the market as a form of liberation and clearly for some, it was that, uh, especially ethnic minorities would we would certainly have seen a market as giving them equal access to resources, whereas before, you know, uh, uh, resources were were largely uh, uh, kind of constrained on the basis of, of ethnicity. Uh, let's say. Um, so, I think I think the way to think about this, Ruben, is to say, well. What is it that's constraining the counter movement's ability to overcome the powerful property class? And I think a large part of that is to do with 
cause division, cause fragmentation, um, lack of solidarity within society, so that the rich and powerful and the state can play one faction against another. Uh, so you go into cultural wars, for instance, where the state can distract uh, legitimate concerns about wealth distribution and issues of uh, economic rights by playing the cultural card and getting them to think that you know issues of identity culture is more important or, or as equally important as those of distribution. And Nancy Fraser writes about this a lot, doesn't she? I mean, I mean, I mean, she, I mean she kind of uh, examines how all too often the politics of identity or recognition has uh, uh, derailed a more radical version of politics in which uh, the politics of distribution gets marginalized. So I think we need to find a way of combining the activists on both sides of these of, of these two camps, uh, the, 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 the politics of recognition with the politics of, 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 of distribution, so that, so that uh, people don't get divided and, 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 uh, 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 and, and have antagonistic relationships when, when the real concern is really is about the, the powerful bankers, the property owners, mm -hmm. the uh, corporate interests, and I, I, uh, there are two questions here. Uh, one is uh, by Nagore Calvo, who would be in charge of regulation? Um, I suppose, I'm not sure if, uh, would you like Nagore to clarify that point? Um, let, let me ask Nagore to unmute himself. Sorry, Nagore, would you mind uh, clarifying that point, regulation? Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, all right. Well, it's because you were saying how important the state was um, in terms of legitimizing the whole governance structure of this rentier economy. So if we take, should we kind of consider the state as part of this regulatory movement or kind of uh, the need of this regulation, or should we kind of take the state out of this equation? And so if we kind of take the state out of this equation, then who is left to do the regulation? Or has to be international, obviously, of course, because you were also kind of talking about the international dimension. No, excellent, excellent question. Um, uh, and uh, let me be clear, I see the state as crucial. Uh, I don't uh, buy into the analysis that somehow the state has been de-hollowed and, well, well, it has been, has been weakened considerably by globalization, but it still remains a key part of the economy uh, and, and, and class struggle as well. And here I kind of draw on Bob Jessup's work on, on the state and argue that the state is very much a site uh, of contestation of social forces. Uh, so if the state has been captured by the rich and the powerful, well, yes, at that particular moment in time, it has been. But that doesn't mean that other groups should give up and, uh, and, and should say, well, you know, what can be done? That's it. The state is merely just a, a, an instrument of the capitalist class. I, 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 would, I don't argue that. And, and both Amir and I are strongly of the position mm -hmm. that the state is key site mm -hmm. of, mm -hmm. of social struggle. Mm -hmm. And uh, it requires uh, 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 activist uh, um, social movements to be engaging with the state in order to bring about change. Yes, it'd be long and hard. Yes, there will be successes and failures, but it is after all a key part mm -hmm. of the uh, economic infrastructure mm -hmm. and the financial uh, structure of the economy that you just couldn't do without. After all, uh, property rights, are legitimized by the state. Mm -hmm. So if you want to restrict uh, uh, 
frontalism. You've got to then restrict mm -hmm. uh, uh, the nature of property rights and uh, rent distribution, which can only be done through, through legislative uh, uh, or, or reforms of, 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 of property. Now, so that does require mm -hmm. engaging with all aspects of the state, mm -hmm. the judiciary, uh, the, uh, the legislature, uh, uh, as well as also the administrative side of mm -hmm. the state. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. Um, John Baker has, has a question. I'll, I'll, I'll um, ask him to, to pose his question perhaps um, uh, live. John, uh, would you mind? Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. So, so you know, my question was just about the use of the idea of under ideas like unearned income and deserving and all that as th as the moral tools for criticizing rent um, extraction, because those ideas have the uh, uh, to me the um, unpalatable implication that people who don't make a contribution to society don't deserve to have what they need in order to live. You know? So, I, I mean, I entirely agree with the idea that uh, rent extraction is objectionable from a moral and um, justice point of view, but I just wonder whether this is the right stick to hit them with. Oh, great. Thanks, John. And, uh, and, and uh, can I just say Ru, that uh, I remember your talk many years ago in Lancaster. I don't know whether you remember this, but uh, I was doing my PhD then. So it's, 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 it's good to hear from you, John. Um, uh, excellent question. Um, but, but I suppose, uh, I think, I think, I think, I think it, it is appropriate, right? So long as we're careful about what we say unearned income refers to. If, by, if we say unearned income refers to the ability of uh, the property class to uh, uh, extract income merely because uh, they have rights to uh, 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 the stream of income um, without, any, without contributing any, any skill or, or labor to it. I think that's very different to things like transfer, uh, uh, transfer payments, where the state in a democratic way can say that people who don't contribute to the economy, such as the ill, the sick, the, the people who are with disabilities, people who are unemployed, people who are uh, nursing or caring for their children or the elderly, um, that, that that kind of transfer, that kind of unearned income is legitimate and acceptable because we as a democratic society take it that they are deserving of payments because, of, because either, either because they are, they are, they are you know, uh, 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 because of, the, of, the, of, the, of their circumstances in which they find themselves in, uh, and that having the income, the state transfers, social support, welfare, welfare benefits is a legitimate form of income. Now, what usually happens, doesn't it, John, is that the, the right are quick to attack the poor for undeserved income, right? Uh, you know, uh, uh, um, demonizing them as scroungers, idlers, who, who don't do anything, and yet look, look how they get their income. You know, they just get it by doing nothing. I think we need to turn that criticism, not merely, uh, uh, we need to turn that criticism to the people at the top. Uh, you know, your Duke of Westminster's, your, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the shareholders and, and other, uh, uh, as, uh, property owning classes who make money by doing nothing. They're the real scroungers. Uh, they're the ones who don't deserve anything. 
uh, and who contribute now. Uh, but it's also to recognize, I think, John, and I think, I think your point is a good one, but it's also to recognize that there will be groups, and rightly so, who will be not able to contribute in terms of wealth creation, but as a democratic society, we still feel it to be important that they are supported uh, because of their uh, uh, circumstances in which they find, whether it be because of caring roles or because of inab or, 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 or inability to work or because of the structural nature of the economy means that they've just been thrown out of work. Well, well, sure, but I suppose, I mean, Go on. I, this partly because, uh, well, part, part of what motivates this is because of my engage, in, involvement in the basic income movement. But and one of the big issues that is always faced when you're talking about basic income is whether or not people have an unconditional entitlement to it enough to meet their basic needs or whether their entitlement is conditional on either they're being engaged in work or they're being unable to work. And they, I mean, there's a long tradition going back to uh, St. Paul and through Lenin and all the, he who does not work shall not eat, right? But many of us in the basic income movement take a more generous view that everyone is entitled to eat. And if you then make a further contribution, then you may be entitled to more. And I, I feel that that is an important moral debate and that you that simply to criticize rent on the basis that you, know, you guys don't do anything therefore you don't deserve any income is on the wrong side of that debate um, um, no no uh, I, I can uh, now I can see where you where you're coming from John yes uh, and this is a, a, a contentious issue about the uh, basic universal income and I know people like uh, uh, guy standing have been uh, you know advocates of, 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 of this, as well as others, uh, as, you, as, you, as you point out, John. Um, I would, you know, again, I think, I think, I think, I think it, it, it's important to realize that contribution to wealth creation can be important and is important. Uh, you know, the old famous Marxist saying, from each according to their ability, to each according to their needs, I think hits hits that home uh, hits that message uh, 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 correctly. I think, um, but it doesn't. I think mean that your point about uh, that people shouldn't be cared for or their flourishing shouldn't be respected. Uh, you know, from flourishing is something that we all ought to have. Uh, and, 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 that's, and that is a universal right, unconditional right. I would agree with you there. Um, where I'm probably kind of slightly not with you, uh, uh, John, is why we would then think that, uh, that if someone doesn't contribute, uh, has, so, so has, has specific assets, uh, why then they should have entitlement to those assets or to, to that income, mainly because of the ownership of, of those assets without contributing anything. Oh, absolutely. I mean, for sure, there are good reasons for rejecting rent. It's just, my, my question is simply whether in the artillery that we use against rentiers, we shouldn't be at least a, a little bit careful about the idea that if you don't make, if you're not doing anything useful, then you shouldn't have any income. That's yeah, that's, yeah. yeah. So, no, so but but again, there are I mean, plenty I, of yeah, other reasons you can use yeah, yeah. besides that. Yeah. yeah, no, 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 no. You're spot on there, John. And uh, and again, as a democratic society, we do make decisions about unearned income, don't we? Where we, where we say that transfers are given to various groups of people who are deserving. Sure. Thanks. Cheers, John. Thanks, John. A final question. We're running out of time. I'll um, ask um, Kahal to. Uh, I'll, I'll mute. Uh, if you don't mind, Kahal, um, um, sharing your question 
it's really the last question um, we have. Um, Thank you. Um, I was wondering more empirically than theoretically, to what extent do other social identities rather than class play a role in who dominates or extracts rents and who doesn't in the two countries that you're talking about? For example, membership of one of the hordes or being of European or Russian descent versus being Kazakh or of Kyrgyz descent. Okay. Um, um, I would I would argue that uh, uh, um, I mean what we found both our mayor found that obviously class is the is the uh, uh, the, the the key issue. Um, as a result of the uh, independence, um, uh, a lot of the titular ethnic minorities, so a lot of the titular uh, ethnic groups uh, did uh, get access to uh, the uh, scarce assets, uh, ownership of banks, um, uh, real estates, and, uh, and, 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 and so on, as well as also being co-owners of uh, um, oil fields, gas fields, and 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 and, and mines. So, so I think uh, uh, I think there is a, there is a, uh, there is definitely uh, a, a, an ethnic dimension there. Whether whether it's an important one, uh, I'm, I would probably dispute that. Uh, I don't think it plays a crucial role. In explaining the dynamics of rent extraction, uh, interestingly, what does play a crucial role was actually looking at the counter movements, in which a lot of the uh, women were either leaders or activists in the uh, grassroots resistance, um, protesting against uh, you know the increased level of debt and campaigning for housing and uh, and land allocation as well as also being involved in the environmental movement. So I think in terms of, in terms of looking at, at the other identities, I probably would, would, would probably argue that uh, uh, probably gender was probably a key role. Uh, uh, obviously, when it comes to corporate, corporate uh, 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 international corporations, uh, we're talking about Western, Western, largely Western-owned corporations, um, Chevron, BP, uh, Canadian companies, uh, they obviously belong to the Anglo-Saxons uh, 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 ethnicities. Um, so, so they were pretty key there. But again, I'm not sure whether ethnicity plays a, a, a necessary role, probably a more of an accidental role as opposed to an essential role uh, in explaining the dynamics between uh, 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 or, or explain the, the dynamics of rent extraction. Hope, hope, hope that answers your question there. Yes, thank you. Cheers. So, thanks so much, Valihar, and thank you all for your questions. Um, we run out of time, unfortunately, but I, I just would like to thank you all for your attendance and thank Valihar uh, for this very interesting talk. And yeah, I'll stop recording now and um, and 